Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Hello, I'm uh, Ed Ludwig for the Doylestown Historical Society, and this is the twelfth in our series of video histories dating back to 1995. For the historical record, it's the fall of 2003, and uh, we're in Doylestown Borough Hall in the office of the Honorable William E. Neese, uh, or Bill, as he likes to be called, the longtime mayor of Doylestown Borough. We're delighted that he's agreed uh, to be interviewed, uh, and this will be a great contribution to help preserve the history of Doylestown. The mission or purpose of our society is to preserve and commemorate Doylestown, its persons, places, and events so that they may be long remembered. And as part of our mission, uh, we interview those people who have extensive recollections of Doylestown and who themselves have been significantly involved in the community. No one fits that description better than his honor, Bill Neese. And it's also fitting that this film be presented uh, for the first time here in Barrow Hall, where he spent so many years of public service. Our thanks to Michelle and Chris of Tully Vision for their able help in producing these interviews and their considerable cooperation with our society. And now, uh, his honor, William E. Neese, mayor of Doylestown Barrow. Mr. Mayor, the Doylestown Historical Society is delighted that you've uh, agreed to do uh, this historic video interview. Uh, you have a tremendous fund of knowledge about Doylestown and your roots go back a number of generations. But first, uh, let me ask you this. How long have you been uh, mayor of Doylestown Borough? Well, I have just recently completed 14 years of service as a mayor of Borough Doylestown, and that was preceded by eight years on the Borough Council. Please tell us about your uh, family and when your family first uh, came to Doylestown. Well, the first immigrant that we had that came into this country was Ferdinand Nice, came from Baden-Baden, Germany in 1850 into the port of Philadelphia at the age of 17. Uh, he had friends in Nockamixon Township in Bucks County and that had a farm there and being a farmer he went up to join him and to live on that farm. He uh, subsequently uh, married a girl by the name of Mary Phillips in that area and in a period of a year or two uh, they've saved enough to purchase a farm on their own. Uh, they had an adjoining farm there where he originally had going to and they farmed this farm for a period of 50 years. Uh, during this time, they had raised uh, 12 children on this farm. In uh, 1902, uh, they had decided to sell the farm and then moved after 50 years and then move into Doylestown. Uh, they moved into uh, number 128 East Oakland Avenue here in Doylestown and uh, they remained there for six years when his wife Mary had died. He then left and went to uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey uh, to live with a daughter. Uh, I had occasion to see him twice in my lifetime. The first time I was there for a visit, he was very active and got around very well. Uh, the second time, he was near death. Uh, he had fallen down the stair steps and punctured a lung, and he died shortly thereafter at the age of 97. Uh, my grandfather, William, 
who was born on the farm there in Naka Nixon, uh, worked on the farm as a youngster. He went to the elementary schools in the Naka Nixon Township. And at the age of 18, he then left to strike out on his own and went to Philadelphia and opened a grocery store. He operated that grocery store for a period of 10 years and then moved back uh, near Doylestown to the Warrington section of Bucks County. And there he met a girl uh, by the name of Jenny Rhodes. Uh, they got married shortly thereafter. And then they had heard that the uh, Railroad House Hotel in Doylestown was going to be sold. So they went to inquire about that and they thought that they would purchase the Railroad House Hotel if they could. So they got all their resources together and they came back to Doylestown and purchased the hotel in 1888 for some of $16,000. Excuse me, Mayor, where was the Railroad House Hotel? I know there isn't one yeah. there now. The Railroad House Hotel was located on Clinton and Bridge Street in Doylestown across from what was then the North Town Penn Railroad Station. Uh, it was a very convenient location for the time because uh, that was a focal point for much of the activities that came in here to town. It was also serviced by the trolley line, a uh, spur that came from Main Street down Court Street and Clinton Street that stopped in front of the hotel. The hotel was a very busy place and uh, they seemed to prosper and do very well there. They uh, made several renovations and then put it on a small addition later on. And uh, the, one of the first thing they did was put a row of sheds from uh, Clinton Street down to Main Street so that their overnight guests could store their horses and wagons there. Uh, the overnight lodging at that time was $1.50 and most of the meals were 50 and 75 cents at that time. It was uh, a very elegant looking place. I remember seeing photographs of it. Okay. They, uh, they remained there for a period of uh, 16 years and my grandfather had then heard that a, it was a bottling establishment on State Street at 125 East State Street. There was for sale. They had a liquor and wine business and a soda manufacturing plant at that time and he went to inquire about that. Uh, he then decided that uh, they would get out of the hotel business and uh, purchase the bottling business, and this was owned by people named the Francis Brothers, uh, which they did. Uh, he and his wife then sold the Railroad House Hotel in 1904 for some around thirty-seven or $38,000. At that time, he then, uh, he had been uh, appointed uh, as a borough councilman for about two and a half years from the third ward, which he enjoyed very much. He was serving on the fire company committee and he hated to leave the council, but he was moving into the first ward, so he had to resign his seat as a borough councilman. They moved into a large home at uh, 106 East Court Street in Doylestown, and here again, this was very conveniently located to his bottling establishment, because when he walked out to the rear of the property, he just walked across an alleyway, and he was in the backyard of the plant that he had purchased on State Street. Uh, he continued to operate that business until 1912, when a property across the street, uh, it was a double frame house, had been put up for sale. And his business had grown to the extent that he felt that he needed more room. So he then purchased that property across the street. He tore down the frame house to the stone foundations and built the remaining building in brick. There was a large barn on the area that was very convenient for his horse and wagons that they used for delivery at that time. And there was also a diagonal alleyway that was shared by two other neighbors so he could get in and out to Oakland Avenue as well as State Street. He continued to operate at that facilities as a sole proprietor until 1919. And my father, Edward, who had been born at the Railroad House Hotel in 1891, uh, grew up there helping his father around the place and tending to the horse and wagons when he was a little bit older. And uh, when they moved to Court Street, of course, he moved to the family as well with them. He then went to the Burroughs schools when he was on Court Street. And when he finished the schooling in Doylestown, he then went to Villanova College. He graduated from Villanova College in 1912 as an electrical engineer. Uh, his first job, he came back to Doylestown at that time and started to work in the Doylestown National Bank. I'm not sure he got this job because his father was a director or not, but that's where he started. Mm -hmm. And uh, this bank was located on the lower grounds of the county courthouse 
uh, facilities in the vicinity of where the Vietnam and the World War II Memorial uh, now exists. That building was then torn down in 1960 with the expansion of the courthouse property. In 1916, he met and married my mother, Anna Major, who had come from Solbury. And uh, after they were married, they too uh, lived into the home on Court Street for one year. At that time, he had uh, saw a newspaper ad that a Gordon construction company in Bristol, who had been operating a shipyard there at that time, uh, was seeking an electrical engineer. He uh, then went to uh, Bristol to inquire about this and they hired him and he and my mother then moved into a small apartment in Bristol uh, near the shipyard where he could walk to work. At the end of World War I, uh, the Gordon Construction Company's contract was finished in Bristol and they were going to move back to their facilities in New York at that time and they wanted my father then to uh, come up to New York with him. Uh, he talked to my mother, but in the meantime, my sister had been born in Bristol, and my mother wasn't anxious to go to New York. So then he followed that up and talked to his father back in Doylestown. And then at that time, he came back, and my father and grandfather formed a partnership of William Neeson's son. So uh, you were born in Doylestown, is that right? Yes. And uh, you mentioned that your grandfather was a member of Borough Council. Uh, was your father or other members of the family involved in Doylestown government? Well, no. Uh, of course, my uh, grandfather had been a member, but to my knowledge, uh, no one else in our family had ever been a member of Borough Council or Borough right. Government. Until you went on, right? Until I was right. elected, yeah. Do you remember your grandfather? Uh... Well, yes, fairly well. My uh, grandfather, who had been born in 1860, he lived to uh, uh, the age of 80 in 1940 when he had passed away. And uh, he was pretty much of a, from my standpoint, a stern and severe person as far as children was concerned. But he did get along very well with his employees and people in general. He usually walked around with a cigar in his mouth, but I'd never seen it lighted. <laughs> Well, then, uh, we come to William E. Neese and Sons Incorporated, right? Uh, can you tell us the history of that company? Uh, well, what had uh, first happened there to my father and grandfather were in their partnership. Uh, prohibition then came into effect. Uh, this had a drastic change in effect on their business. They no longer had the liquor and wine business. Uh, the beer business that they had that were selling to the hotels was then going to be near beer, which a much less alcoholic content, and of course they still had their soda water business. Uh, two years after that, a salesman had stopped uh, that was selling an orange soda type of drink. The drink was called Whistle, and at that time my father was looking something to increase their business, so they took on that franchise. <laughs> Uh, this drink turned out to be almost uh, an overnight success. There wasn't a lot of competition in the area at the time, and it went to the point where the present machinery could not take care of the production of the whistle end of it. So they then put in t uh, two filling machines instead of one, and then this solved the problem. Uh, this went on until about 1928. Uh, well, my father thought that they should uh, possibly have a drink that might sell a little bit better in the winter time, and they decided to try a chocolate drink. Uh, they went to uh, Hershey Chocolate to get their powder uh, for this drink, and then when they started to produce the chocolate drink, the first thing they found out that the chocolate uh, settled to the bottom of the bottle, and they always had to be sh shaken before they could drink from the bottle. Uh, my father then worked on this process, and uh, th through a formula of his own, he was able to have a non-settling chocolate drink where the chocolate would not settle to the bottom of the bottle. He had a five-year limited patent on this from the government, and uh, this worked out very well. When that happened, he then uh, went back to the Hershey people to talk to them about this business. And at this time, I, I was asked to go along with him, and I always enjoy enjoyed riding with him. We, at that time, we had a 1927 Oakland touring car, and I liked the open space of the car, so I went to Hershey with him, and we sat down in this uh, large office, and I was just sat over in the corner. My father and this gentleman would talk for about an hour. At the end of the conversation, uh, my father was getting ready to leave, and the man from the desk came over, and he asked me if I would like to have a Hershey bar. 
And I was thinking of one of these uh, bars, which today probably cost 60 or 70 cents, probably four or five cents at that time, that I was able to eat that on the way home. He came back in a moment or two, and he had this big package. It was about 20 inches by 30 inches square, and it was all wrapped up. And when he undid this thing, here was a big uh, piece of, solid piece of chocolate. It was about an inch and a half thick with the word Hershey written across it. And I felt at that time that uh, this was probably something that they used in their advertising business. So we rewrapped up the uh, Hershey bar and uh, took it out to the car. My father got a blanket out of the back of the car and wrapped it up because he wanted to make sure it didn't break or anything on the way home, put it on the back seat. Uh, when we got home, my father said that he was going to carry the bar in and put it on the uh, cellar floor. So we walked through the house and right away my sister says, what do you have there? I told her, man, you give me a Hershey bar. And of course she didn't believe us until she followed us downstairs. When we got in the basement, uh, we opened up the package and here was this great big uh, chocolate bar. My father then got a chisel and a hammer and uh, we chiseled off a couple pieces of the chocolate to try it right then and there. And he said, this is going to be too much for us. He says, when you see some of the boys in the neighborhood, he <laughs> says, bring them in and uh, chip off a piece of chocolate so they can each have a piece of chocolate. But he says, be careful of the chisel. So I told him I would, and I could hardly wait till the next day to see these fellows that usually played in the back alleys and things in our area. So as soon as I saw them the next day, I told them I had this big, big chocolate bar if they liked to have some chocolate. So they all rushed in the cellar door and got in to see this piece of chocolate. I think there were six fellows at the time. So I knocked off a couple of big chunks of chocolate for each one of them, and they got ready to leave. And two of the fellows that had sisters, they said that uh, would it would be possible that they could take a piece of chocolate to their sisters. So I knocked off two other pieces of chocolate and everybody left. And about a week later, my father says, we still have too much chocolate here. We don't want you getting sick or anything. But if the boys want any more, ask them to come back and have some more chocolate. So this I did. And when they came back in the next time, of course, I took off some more of the chocolate. And they reached in with their dirty hands, because I think the boys at that time only washed their hands on Saturday nights anyway. But they took the chocolate. And two of the fellows that had been there previously that had the sisters were there again. And they told me that their sisters liked this chocolate so much, would it be possible they could still take two more pieces with them? So I said, sure, we have plenty. And they took the two extra pieces, and everybody left. And it must have been 10 days or so later when I saw the two girls outside playing that uh, they were the sisters of these boys. And I went over to ask them how they liked the chocolate that their brothers gave me. And they never heard tell of anything about this chocolate business. The boys kept that for themselves. So when I inquired with them, they just laughed at me. And that was the end of the chocolate bar. <laughs> but the chocolate business uh, was a hardworking business. Well, that, excuse, before you go ahead, how large was this? chocolate when you first got it. What did it weigh? Can you remember? I don't know the weight of it, Judge. Uh, it was about 20 inches by 30 inches. It was about an inch and a half thick. Really? Uh, a substantial piece uh, like the bigger than this right. sheet of paper. Yeah. Far, and, that, and that thick. Well, you don't see that anymore, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not that size. At least right. I haven't seen that size. But the, the, the chocolate business was... Uh, uh, a hard working business uh, after the bottles were bottled uh, that had to be put in pasteurizers. So that meant we had to have two pasteurizing machines, we had two gas burners for the heat in that. Uh, the bottles, once they were bottled, had to be put in an iron cage and then rolled into the pasteurizers. When that was finished, they were brought out and then with heavy gloves, they had to be taken out individually and put in the boxes for storage until they cooled. It was very cumbersome. But uh, the pro chocolate business was somewhat profitable. We were able to charge a little bit more money for it, uh, but it took up a lot of space and a lot of room. Well, how long did uh, William E. Neese and Sons uh, continue on? Well, at, at, at that point in time, uh, we, uh, the 21st Amendment then came into effect, and the prohibition was going to be repealed. And immediately my father and grandfather were aware that the beer business was going to be increasing considerably. And so at that point, they then decided that the chocolate business took so much time and space, and they needed all the space they had, so they then decided to get rid of the chocolate business. Uh, the next thing was that my father went to the Valley Forge Brewing Company in Norristown. Uh, we then secured a contract for them for all their products as soon as the uh, if a amendment came into effect, 
that we would be the, an exclusive distributor for all of Bucks County. Uh, this uh, seemed to work out very well at the time, but then the first thing that happened, uh, we realized that the keg beer that we were getting uh, was also not pasteurized and had to be kept refrigerated. We didn't have room to, for this refrigeration at that time, but we, under our rear platform, we built two rooms and insulated the walls. And each day we would get cakes of ice and then slide between the kegs to keep them cool. And this was somewhat satisfactory, but uh, it was cumbersome and sort of messy to work with. And what, what period of time are we talking this about This was now? in 1933. Right, uh, and the business was located where in Dawson? At, at 124-126, the state seat where my grandfather had converted the double right. house in, into the plant. Very good. Please and go ahead. Then at that time, uh, to take care of the keg situation, there was a decision made to, to build a keg house, and we had plenty of room in the lower portion of the yard, so we built a masonry building. When that building was finished, uh, that we could then store 300 half barrels of, of beer at one time with a water cool compressor, and this worked out very good for a number of years. So you were involved in the business from what age? Uh, well, as a kid, I used to go there and do a lot of things. Right. Uh, what what finally happened after the uh, beer business came back and was in effect, and the keg room and things were established in 1937. Uh, it was decided that we needed a more prestige ginger ale to accompany our business. So uh, my father then contacted a company called Clico Club Company that was located in uh, Millis, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. And uh, they came down and looked over our situation and uh, they decided then to offer us a franchise uh, for Bucks, Montgomery County and Hunterton County, New Jersey. Uh, this uh, proved to work out very well, but immediately again we'd had six or seven uh, large uh, distributors, particularly in Montgomery County, that started to buy by truckload lots. And here again our machinery would not have been able to accommodate uh, the demand for, for the beverages. So there was then at that time uh, I'd been working there, you see, after school helping to unload trucks. And on Saturdays, well, I, I usually had to sort all the soda bottles from the trucks and things because the, uh, all the bottles can be all mixed up with their cases and things. And uh, it was just a continuous process to do that. I was there one particular time sorting on a Saturday and my father and grandfather came to the building. I think I saw them before they did, so I started working real hard when they got there. <laughs> and they came out on the platform. Uh, I thought, well, this is a good opportunity for me to say something that maybe I can get a couple dollars for this work and just set a donut for my board, so to speak. So I, my grandfather and father was standing there, and I said to my father, uh, I would like to be paid for this. I says, everybody else that's working around here gets a little bit of money. He didn't say anything for a minute, and he says, well, if you work all day Saturdays, we will then give you $2. And I, of course, didn't think it was enough. My grandfather thought it was too much and almost bit his cigar in half. But the $2 price is what stayed uh, for quite some time. Well, in but the mid-1930s, you were, what, about 15, I was in 16, high school at that time. At, at that time? Yes. Right. Please, I interrupted you. Go no, ahead. That's no problem. So the, the machinery uh, then had to be changed. We contacted a company called George Myers Machinery Company from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, they were very big in the beer industry and in the dairy farm business out there. And they had a representative in the Philadelphia area. So then we changed all our equipment and all our machinery in the whole building. We started in the syrup room upstairs. Uh, we changed our old glass line tanks to stainless seals with built-in agitators in them. We put a new larger washing machine into the building as big as we, uh, the space would permit us. Uh, we then put in a new filling machine. This new filling machine uh, would then uh, put out 72 bottles a minute on small size bottles and 35 quart bottles a minute. Uh, this worked out very well, and after the filling machine, then it went to a mix and tumbling machine, and then to an automatic labeler, and uh, after the automatic labeler, there was a man that put the bottles in the boxes. And alongside of him, a hole was cut in the floor to the basement area, and we installed a belt conveyor. 
and when the man had the cases filled, he just put the, the box on the belt conveyor and went down then to the seller on a round table and onto a conveyor line and the man the seller would then stack them for storage. But the conveyor system then all run through to the back of the building with an electric lift. So then we could also load our trucks from down there and all the man had to do was just put the cases on the rollers and they'd automatically be fed into the trucks. And uh, this worked very well. From 1946 until 1956, I was back there then working full time with my father. Uh, I had charge then of doing all the mixing of the sodas and taking care of all the inventories and things. Uh, two of the uh, major things that we had uh, were bottles and sugar. Uh, our glass bottles at that time were then coming from Glenshaw Glass Company in Glenshaw, Pennsylvania, just north of Pittsburgh. They were being shipped in by railway car to Doylestown Freight Station, but I'd made at least some space from the Grove and Carworth and Lumberyard to Storm, which was only across the street and very convenient for us, so that's where the bottles were put till we were ready to use them. Uh, the sugar uh, was also another problem at times. Uh, you could not order sugar through the refineries or anything. The sugar orders had to get through a sugar broker and after he was notified that you needed a shipment in three or four days and you would get a notice that uh, you're ready to pick up. We hauled our own sugar and I did all the hauling for that uh, 10 year period from the refineries from Craker Sugar Refinery in Philadelphia from uh, Shackamaxon and Delaware Avenue and each of our loads of sugar were then 10,000 pounds of sugar per load. Uh, previously when we had brought sugar to our place it used to be backed up to a platform and then hand carried upstairs and put on pallets to where we're ready to use them. I then got my father to put in a steel I-beam on the second floor that ran it over a driveway and I uh, had an electric lift installed on, on this uh, line and then when we pulled the truck underneath in the driveway from underneath we had two navy canvas hammocks and with that we could pick up 500 pounds at a time and bring the sugar right to where we were going to storm and uh, that was much more convenient. Well, you were making more than two dollars a day at that point, right? <laughs> uh, when I was working steady, it, it increased slightly. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned that uh, the business went on until 1956, is that right? Uh, or 57, when, when was it? Uh, well, actually it went on until 1957. In 1956, uh, my father had died. At that time, the business, both the beer business and the soda business, had been changed drastically. He was a little bit reluctant to make any changes, but after he had passed away, I continued the bottling part for almost another year. But I decided to tackle the uh, beer business problem first. We had a lot of 100% uh, customers at that time that were very loyal to us, but they, again, their customers were demanding new and different products that were then coming into the market. They wanted to continue to deal with us, but they uh, needed these other beverages. So I then went to the Valley Forge Brewing Company and was able to change our contract. We still handled their products, but uh, not on an exclusive basis. And they could sell the home distributors on a direct basis, and this worked out very well. I uh, went to a couple of the large uh, master importing distributors, and they would get a dozen different, more popular brands at that time. And this, in turn, uh, satisfied all our beer customers. I then turned to our soda account because I knew that this was also a problem with them. At that time, uh, the non-deposit bottles were beginning to come into effect. Uh, people wanted cans, they wanted six-pack packaging, and it was the start of some of the plastic bottles. And I realized at that time there was no way in our operation that I could ever take care of that type of the business. So I uh, made a decision as much as I didn't want to do it. My heart was really in the soda business. But I then went to a large manufacturer in the Allentown area that I'd known for a period of years and told him I was thinking about discontinuing the bottling business and I would like to haul the, the product from his place. We would do it with our own trucks and he said this was fine and just to let him know a day or two before when we were ready to start. So I then came back to Doylestown and I put an ad in one of our trade journals and in a very sh short time I had gotten a call from a Coca-Cola plant in Willing, West Virginia. Uh, at that time, they were only bottling Coca-Cola in a small six and a half ounce returnable bottle, but they wanted to experiment with other various different sizes, and our equipment could make and fill all different size bottles. So they came to Dawestown, and we made arrangements with them, and they bought all our equipment, all our tanks, and everything. I uh, then uh, 
went and called uh, Benjamin uh, Rigging Company in Philadelphia. They come up and haul everything out to West Virginia. And when in about two months after that, uh, we everything was going on well. I was hauling our beverages from Allentown and we were getting all the beer products we need. And, and then it was one Friday evening, I woke up about midnight in our apartment house, which is directly behind the warehouse, and smoke was coming through our building. Uh, I didn't at the time know where, what was happening or where it was coming from. I immediately went to the rear of the building. At that time, I saw the flames and the fire coming out of the warehouse section of the building. And uh, at the same time, the fire whistle had gone off. Some of the people from the Moose Lodge had come out, saw the fire, and they called the fire company. Uh, my wife then immediately took care of the two children and I rushed over to see what I could do at that time because I had just recently purchased a, a new truck that I wanted to try to save if at all possible. When I got over to the building, everything was extremely hot. I was able to open the one half of the one door that was in front of the new truck and I saw the truck to the right of that was already on fire. But I hopped in the, the new truck and drove it out through the building, knocking the other half of the door off and stopping out into the yard area. But the heat had been so intense that the uh, cool air, when it hit the cab of the truck, disintegrated both of the glass doors at the same time. But other than that, there was no major damage to the truck. Everything else in that building uh, was uh, destroyed or had to be destroyed at that time. The uh, fire company then did an excellent job of trying to save the cool room, which they did and it was very important to us. After a week's time, uh, then I decided to put up a new masonry building and when I looked over the situation I then realized that the driveway from our apartment complex was in direct line with our driveway that went up to State Street so I built a larger building with a higher interior put two 14-foot overhead doors on there so I was able to drive either trucks or trailers in from either street and out the other way and load and unload. I then bought a forklift uh, truck and several pallets and then we went into a forklift operation. Well, in its heyday was uh, William E. Neeson Sons, Inc., uh, a major manufacturer of soft drinks and a, a bottler and yeah, distributor we were, of beer? At, at that time, we were one of the largest. There were several others. There were, we were one of the largest in the county uh, mm -hmm. that my father and grandfather had gotten started with that business and uh, maybe being uh, not necessarily pioneers, but being out in the rural sections, uh, we were able to do very well. Uh, we serviced uh, many of the roadside restaurants and uh, hotels and stores and things of that nature. And uh, we covered all the f various fairs that come through the area from Allentown over to Trenton. And uh, this uh, in turn worked out very well. Well, what happened after the fire? After the fire? Right. Well, after the fire, of course, I, I rebuilt the new building. Uh -huh. and. Uh, and then when it was uh, finally completed, then we were able to uh, work under redistribution basis as we had started to do previously, and uh, this really worked out fine. Uh, did you did the business continue? Did you remain with the business? Yeah. Well, at that time, uh, I continued on with the business for a period of another twenty years. Uh, near the end of that twenty-year period, I was getting inquiries from some of the larger distributors. Uh, wanting to buy our business and things and at first that I told them that I really wasn't interested Things were going along pretty good and we were quite satisfied, but if I ever decided to do anything uh, Any sale would have to include all the employees with the guaranteed jobs About a month after the talk to a couple of people I got a call one day from a concern in Bristol that I've been buying about 60% of our um, beer products too, and he said he wanted to come up and talk to us, and I said, well, that's fine, but it still would have to include all the employees. So we came up and we spent a couple hours talking over the situation, and he wanted to buy our license and our business. He wanted us to remain on our same location for a period of one year. At uh, that point in time, uh, if we could not find a larger facilities where we could handle a trailer operation more readily, we would move everything to, to Bristol. In the meantime, he would pay us rent for our property as well. And uh, everybody would go to Bristol, and then I would remain as a salesman for him uh, to call on his wholesale accounts from uh, uh, Newtown up as far as Quakertown. And uh, I would work out of my own home 
and just go to Bristol for two hours on Monday morning for sales meetings and call in occasionally. And I continued to do this for 11 years, more years, and then retired. You told us that you were born and grew up in Doylestown, and I think you mentioned going to school here, but tell us a little bit more about your schooling and education, if you would. Well, in 1919, when my folks had moved back from Bristol, they moved into a small apartment at number 7 West Oak Avenue here in Doylestown with my sister. And then when I was born there, there after that they were there, uh, with the four of us, it seemed to be too crowded. Uh, we then moved down to 200 Green Street into a brick trend home. And then when my younger sister was born, uh, we moved up the street to 180 Green Street into a single home. And we all remained there until uh, after we had got married. But uh, my schooling at that time, the first two years, uh, in school, I went to St. Bernard's School here in Doylestown uh, over by the Mount Carmel Church. Uh, it was a two-room schoolhouse at that time. There were four grades in each of the rooms. There were two grades of seats for each of the grades, and one none in each room. But when it was time for to go into third grade, uh, my father had pulled me out of school, and I don't know for what reason, and put me in the public school. And then I went to the Borough Public School and graduated from Doylestown High School there in uh, 1938. Incidentally, uh, how many Bill nieces have there been in Doylestown? Well, to my knowledge, there's been four of us. It was started with my grandfather and then myself and my son and his son. I see. What about your early recollections of uh, Doylestown, uh, Bill, uh, the characteristics of the town? how you remember the people lived in your life growing up in Doylestown? Well, there were a lot of boys that lived in our area and there was always people to play with. In the summertime, of course, the alleyways weren't paved or anything and we always played a lot of marbles. Uh, we pitched quakes and we played a game called Mumbly Peg with a pen knife and one blade. Uh, this might be frowned on today, but we never had any problems with it as far as I know. And of course, there was always baseball to be played. The baseball that we played was across the street on Green Street at Scout Way, where the Scout Boy Scouts headquarters are today. And uh, our game was a little different. We never had enough fellows for full teams or anything like that. And we'd start with two batters, and the rest of the fellows we had would then take the various positions. And uh, any time one of the batters either fly out or got tagged out, we only went to first base and back. Then they, in turn, would move to the outfield and then have to work their way back. Uh, some of the problems that we had, we never had a very decent baseball or anything of that nature. And one time my uh, father uh, came across some coach that was coaching a team somewhere nearby and he told them that uh, he would give them their balls uh, when they didn't use them any longer. Sometimes the stitching got bad or the covers came loose if we could use them. So when my father gave me those balls, I would take off the outside cover and then get some tire tape and tape the balls as tight as I could. Usually, of course, this was normally in the summertime, the tire tape was sticky and things, so we then have to roll the ball in the dirt a couple times, and by the next day, it usually worked out fairly well. The only other problem we had with baseball was sometimes we had foul balls, the balls would then go off over the bank and down into Green Street, and it wasn't that there was so much traffic or anything at that time, but it was sort of a nuisance to go chase them. So we figured out if we could try and make some kind of a backstop that might help. So a couple of fellows uh, from their homes got uh, four bean poles. Uh, everybody had a small garden at that time, so we lapped the bottom of the poles together and nailed them tight and got some old chicken wire and put it between them and dug two holes behind them on the plate and then put up this backstop. And it worked out uh, reasonably well. Uh, most of the girls at that time uh, did a lot of roller skating and jumping the rope. Uh, like double Dutch was one of the more prevalent things at that mm. time. I tried it a couple of times with my sister and usually ended up falling down, so that didn't work out too well for me. And in 1927, when the Fanny Chapman Pool opened here in Doylestown, uh, I happened to be there or was able to go there the opening day, and I thought how tremendous that was. The cost of the tickets that time for the season was a dollar and fifty cents. Uh, this pool was put there by Martha and William Mercer here in Doylestown, 
and then they had also established a trust fund, which is still in existence today. So that's what helped subsidize the, the pool at that time. There aren't many communities that are fortunate enough to have a <clears throat> public pool like that, are there? Well, that's right. At that time, of course, there was only the one pool. It was two feet deep at one end and nine, the other with two diving right. boards. Today, there's approximately five pools there in a much bigger complex. But Doylestown has been very fortunate to have that type of facility right. here to use. Uh, when my sister and I got just a little bit older, our parents thought that we should be taking music lessons, and uh, this didn't go over too well with us. Uh, but uh, my sister ended up uh, that she was going to be playing the Hawaiian guitar, and I was to play the mandolin. And uh, we're, we were to take our lesson from a uh, man named uh, Charles Shabinger. He owned a bakery shop here in Doylestown on South Main Street, right next to the Doylestown bookstore where it is today. And uh, he was a very large man, and I also thought that uh, maybe he ate a lot of his own donuts or anything, but I never had the nerve to say anything to him. He was also the music director for the Salem Reformed Church here in Doylestown, and then he taught music lessons on the side. He lived down on South Main Street where the atrium is today in a large Victorian home, and I always sort of enjoyed going to the house because all his outside doors were split doors at that time, so whenever you went to the door, they'd always open the top door first to see who was there, and if they wanted you to come in, then they opened the bottom door, and I always thought that was pretty neat. But my sister and I went together there a good bit of the time, and then she would take her lesson first for a half hour, and then I'd wait and take mine for a half hour, and then we'd walk home together, and it wasn't really too far to go. And when we got home, of course, we were supposed to practice for a half hour. Well, my younger sister at that time thought that the noise we made was so awful, and she couldn't stand the noise and complain to my mother all the time. But we really didn't pay too much attention to her. We just went on and did what we were supposed to. And I recall later on that she had to take piano lessons. And uh, when she started that, I didn't think too much of her playing either. <laughs> but uh, the music lessons went fairly well. My sister didn't really want to do it and didn't stay with it. I uh, stayed with it at the time. And the following spring, uh, Mr. Shatner told me that they were going to have a uh, orchestra formed and we were going to play at some eighth grade graduations in the country and some strawberry festivals and he would get these people together and then we would have one session first uh, to, to all practice together and he told me what day and time to be there. Of course I was always a, an early person, I was there first and I was in the music room sitting there by myself and pretty soon all these old people come into the room with their instruments and I looked around the room and I was wondering what I was doing there with all these people and I was sure all of them must have been close to 30 years of age but, but they treated me pretty good and I got along fairly well with them and we did play that whole summer and the end of the summer he told us we had a surprise that we were then going to play on a radio station in Philadelphia from 11 to 12 on a Saturday morning which we did and that was sort of the height of my music career although I uh, continue to play at the time. I still have an instrument today and I play for my own amusement. In the winter time there was also a lot of things for the kids and boys to do at that time. Uh, sledding of course was always very popular. The uh, snow seemed to stay around a lot longer. The streets weren't salted or anything. Uh, most of the sledding that we did in our area was on Hillside Avenue and Green Street down by the Country Club. Uh, the people from uptown usually sledded on uh, Shul Avenue near the firehouse. Uh, Union Street would be roped off from 6 to 9 o'clock in the evenings and at 9 o'clock the fire whistle would blow and then everybody had to leave the streets and go home. And that worked out uh, reasonably well. Ice skating, of course, was always a big thing. Uh, we didn't have the skates like they have today. Our skates were just the uh, skates that were with clamp on type. And most of the time we just carried a key to make them tight to our boots or shoes, put a strap over our ankles and then away we would go. A lot of the skating that I did was across the street from where I used to take my music lessons and it was a home that was uh, owned by a man by the name of Frank Lewis who had a lumber yard here in Doylestown on Main Street. And uh, <clears throat> it was a nice large uh, pond area and with a concrete lip around the outside of the thing. And uh, generally there was many girls there sometimes as there were fellows. The girls usually congrat got together on music on one end of the pond and whenever the fellows would see this then we would try to play crack the whip and see how fast and how close we 
could go to the girls and they would holler and squeal a little bit, but uh, we just tried to go that much faster. And of course, one day Mr. Lewis came out and he called all his boys over and he said that he wanted us to come and skate there as much as we wanted to, but we had to behave ourselves. We're not to scare the girls anymore or we're not going to be allowed to skate there. <laughs> so we promised him that we wouldn't do that anymore. And I found out later on that he was an uncle to one of the girls that used to come there to skate and she probably told him what we were doing. Uh, and the one winter I decided I would like to do some trapping because I heard about some of the fellows that were doing trapping in the winter time. And I asked my father one day if he would go to the hardware store and buy me three or four traps that I'd like to go trapping. Well, the first thing he asked me where I was going, I told him I was going down to Mr. Clemens' farm right nearby, down to Todd's Pond, which is down the bottom of the Green Street Hill because they both allowed the boys there to trap as long as they behaved themselves. So he says, well, he would think about it. And the subject come up at the dinner table that night. And my mother said, what are you doing about this, this trapping business I've been hearing about? I says, well, I says, we, uh, we get these traps and then we put them in these various holes by the, the streams and then we catch these animals. And about that time, my father says, well, you know, that uh, if you go trapping, you have to get up early in the morning, you have to look at them in the afternoon, and that requires a lot of time. I says, well, we're going to do this in pairs, and I'm going to do it with the... Uh, Dick Bryan, his father owned the Chrysler garage up the street, and he lived over in Franklin Street, but he was over in our area a good bit of the time. And one week I would go in the early morning, and he'd do the afternoon, then we'd reverse around the next week. Well, my mother says, what are you going to do with these animals when you get them? I says, well, we take a canvas bag with us and a club, and whenever we see a, a muskrat in the trap, I just whack it over the head and <laughs> take the muskrat out of the trap and put it in the bag and bring it home, and then we'd skin it and put it on a board and hang it in the cellar. She said, oh no, you're not going to hang, I'm not going up and down the cellar steps seeing a bunch of dead muskrats hanging in my cellar. So I said, well, I'll talk to Dick and see what his mother says. And of course, uh, he went and talked to his mother and she didn't really care. So we only did it for the one season. We made out fairly well. And each time that we sold the muskrats, he would get an extra quarter out of what we sold because we had the muskrats at his house. <laughs> so th this was, was pretty good. And then there was also several chores that we had to do around the house uh, in the winter time and there was always uh, taking care of the coal bins and make sure there's coal in the fire and raking the pipe of the cedar and taking the ashes out and things and the one thing i didn't care particularly about was the emptying of the water pan for our ice box that was in the kitchen at that time the ice man used to bring the ice in put it in the top of your box and then it would gradually melt and there was a tube in the bottom and would run into the pan underneath the the ice box and if you didn't empty it in time, of course, it ran out over the floor in the kitchen. And even when it got pretty full, I usually ended up spilling half of it by the time I got to the sink. And we had a closed back porch at our house at that time. And my mother kept her big, big old towel out there in the porch. So whenever I spilled any of the water, of course, I had to wipe it up all the time. And I often thought many a time that we probably had one from the amount of water I spilled one of the cleanest floors in Doylestown. But nothing was too much said about that. And the other chore that I had was sort of a weekly chore that I really didn't mind doing was taking my father's shirts over to a woman that did the washing and iron thing. Her name was Mrs. Bickle, and she lived on Bridge Street, which is right nearby. And whenever you went in your house, you could never see across the room because there was just shirts all over the place. And I figured she must have done it for that whole end of town, but uh, she was a very nice woman of things. And alongside of her house, there was an underground stream that had run in there all the time. And... Uh, in the early days, it, uh, when it got to the street level, it ran over top of the street down the alleyway and across Hillside Avenue into the Clemens Farm area. And uh, the people at that time built a small bridge over the stream from the wintertime so that the horses, when they went up and down the street, wouldn't slip and fall on the ice or anything. Uh, later on, the burr had piped the stream underneath the street and the bridge was done away with, but that was one of the reasons some of the people told me that's how the street got named for that bridge and that's the reason they called it. At Bridge Street at that time. But out near the uh, curb line of the, where this stream ran, there was an open box, and uh, any time we wanted a drink in the summertime, we'd just get down on our hands and knees and cup our hands, and we'd be able to get all the water we wanted to and have a lick of the water and stuff. And this one day, it was really pretty hot out when I was taking the shirts over to Mrs. Bickle and went to the house, and uh, she said something about, uh, Billy, it's pretty warm out there today. And I said, yeah, it sure is. And she said, just a minute. And of course, every time he took shirts there, she always had to check where they had hangers. If you didn't have all the hangers for all the shirts, you had to go home and get the hangers because she wasn't going to furnish any hangers. So I told her about this uh, water bin. And I said, you know, it would be nice, Mrs. Bickle, if he put a cup out there for us boys to drink out with them, we wouldn't have to cup the water in our hands. It would be a little easier. 
And she didn't say anything her minute. She says, uh, well, I'm not going to put a cup out there. You boys would just steal it. And I said, oh, we'd never do anything like that. Nothing more was said for a minute. I got the, the clean shirt and ready to leave. And she says, well, if I ever put a cup out there, she says, I'm going to put a chain on it. And she just <laughs> sort of laughed, and I left and didn't think anything more about it. So at that time, and uh, about a week later, when I bought the other shirts back, here enough was a nice shiny cup and a chain through the handle. The end of the chain was screwed into the little frame back at the top of this hole. And people for years they all drank out of the same cup in the same hole there. Nobody seemed to get sick or anything. If they did, they didn't complain. So that, that's what we did there at Mrs. Bickle's place. Bill, uh, from one generation to the next, or however you want to look back on it, how would you say Doylestown has changed, or has it remained pretty much the same? Well, there, there's been some uh, really drastic changes today. Uh, the people that go to the stores, they hop in their SUVs and bother the kids in, go to the uh, supermarkets, and they push their own carts around, they wait on themselves, and then stand in line to, to pay their bill. And life at home, uh, when I was growing up, was much different. Uh, most of the, the mothers were at home. We had a bread man that came to our house. Uh, we had a baker man that came to our house. We had a meat truck that came once a week. And sometimes during the summertime, the local farmers and things would bring vegetables there to the house. And of course, there was always the milkman. Anytime you wanted to change your order for the milkman, all you had to do was write on a slip of paper, stick it in the empty bottle, and he would make sure that you got whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. And the ice man, of course, was always a big thing with the ice boxes at that time. And they had sort of a unique thing. They'd give you a card, and you were supposed to keep this card in your front window. So when the ice man would pull up with the ice truck, he, all he had to do was look at this card, and he'd know what size piece of ice it, uh, to bring into your house. There were four different numbers. Now, if you found up or something and forgot to change the card or uh, had the wrong size thing at there at the time, well, you got a little bit of a static or an argument from them. But for the most part, it, it worked out really well. And, uh, and Do you remember uh, Doylestown's... Uh, Centennial celebration in 1938 and the sesquicentennial in 1988? Yeah, well, there were two similar but different types of celebration in 1938. It was the year I graduated from high school at that time, and that was going to be a week-long celebration. Uh, there was to be a queen who was going to be selected. We had one girl from the senior class and one from the junior class, and we sold tickets that were going to be a big show at the fairgrounds at the end of that week. And the girl that had the most tickets sold on her behalf, she was the one that was going to be the queen. We had various floats and things that took place in that period of time. But the girl that was the senior girl at that time, she had the most tickets sold in her name, so she was the uh, queen of the show at that time. In uh, 1988, it was a little bit different here. Uh, they were going to have different things for different months of the year. And the one that I sort of enjoyed the most was the History Month when they had a History Day at the James Laura House here in Doylestown. And the current council people at that time then dressed up like the people in 1838. They had their council meetings, you know, everyone gave a speech. At the conclusion of that, then we all marched up Broad Street to the old borough school grounds and planted a scholar tree there. And I always thought that that was very nice. When and how did you become mayor and, and what are some of the mayor's duties? Well, in uh, 1980, a member of council had resigned uh, from the first ward, and so there was a vacancy there, and I was asked if I was interested, which I told him I had more time at that point in time, and I told him I was interested or I'd like to inquire about it. So I was then appointed in June of 1980 that year. Two years later, then I was appointed the, as the vice president of the council and served in that position for six more years. In 1988, in October, the council president at that time informed me that he was moving out of the burr into Buckingham Township, and I would have to assume his duties at that point in time. And almost at the same time, the mayor had indicated to me that uh, he had been thinking about retiring for some time. So I told him that if he would wait a little bit till we got the council presidency straightened out, and then I talked to him and see if we could work out a time that would suit him. So this is what he did. The, uh, Council President then resigned, and in January of the following year, we had a reorganization meeting, and a new Council President was elected. And 60 days after that, the present mayor then resigned, and Council appointed me to that position. 
The duties are sort of twofold. The uh, mayor is the civilian head of the uh, borough police department, and I do confer almost daily with the chief of police and all the activities taking place here. Uh, we have to meet occasionally with the civil service committee. Uh, we meet monthly with the safety, public safety committee that's comprised of three members of the council, the chief and myself. And uh, I also work a lot with the uh, council itself. I attend all their meetings, uh, both public and private. I take care of all the uh, special presentations at the meeting. I give the oath of office to the officer. Very interesting uh, about, I don't think most people realize or understand what it means to be uh, mayor of Doylestown Borough. Uh, what else can you tell us about that? Well, um, as the mayor, uh, besides that, I occasionally give talks to the elementary school children, it's usually at election time, to explain to them how the various peoples get elected to offices, what they do after they are elected. Uh, I also serve on the airport advisory committee that's uh, uh, mainly interested in what's happened for the safety aspects of the town. And two of the bigger things that require a fair amount of time is the Memorial Day Parade business. I'm uh, in charge of the uh, Memorial Day Parade, and this takes almost a two-month period. Uh, formerly in the olden days, uh, the school children used to bring uh, flowers to the school in the morning of Memorial Day. We would then march them to the American Legion home where they lay the flowers on the table. Uh, the ladies auxiliary would then tie them and take them to the cemetery, and we'd march the children back up to school and they'd be dismissed for the day. That no longer takes place, and now currently what's been happening for a number of years, a uh, few of the auxiliary members uh, that have flowers of their own bring flowers to the Legion home the day before. And my wife and I have a few friends where we're able to get flowers from, so we usually end up getting a carload. They then have to be put in water and ready for the next day. But the day, and for the parade itself, requires a lot of uh, conversation with a lot of people. I am, have to start usually in March. I meet with all the veterans organizations to find out what order of march they want to be into, who's going to be in the honor guard, whether the flags are ordered uh, to hand out the day of the parade and things like that. I then have to uh, contact the security office at the courthouse grand so that uh, they would be somewhere there so we can have the facilities that take place there in the flag raising. I have to contact the uh, one of the administrators from the Cebu school district so that the uh, War Memorial Field will be open for our services that take that place there as well. I have to contact the National Guard to let them know what streets that they're going to be on to. And then we have an honor guard and fire and guard at the, at the cemetery. When that takes place, I have to contact the Shriners organization to find out how many of their people are coming and let them know where they're going to be stationed before the parade for the parade to start. And uh, I have to contact the, several of the automobile agencies so I have enough convertibles for the people that need to ride. They can't walk anymore. And in previous years, and then it's the making up of the, uh, the list, and ten of listed stuff, and sometimes this could change it over a period of time to almost the last day, but the ten of the list and the order of the parades have to be made up. And then in the former days, I used to have five or six of the veterans that used to give me a hand, and when we were ready to start the parade, then they would have these lists and would be able to uh, funnel the uh, people in in the right order. Uh, recently, uh, I have to make sure that the uh, band director is aware of our situation. We currently have seven bands from the CB school district that uh, uh, we have to put in a parade. I have to know where they're going to be located and what order that they're going to be in. And then the day of the parade itself is always a hectic situation. Uh, we have over a thousand participants in our parade and everybody congregates in one locality almost at the same time and in 45 minutes. This all has to be sorted out and uh, put in the proper line. Uh, I currently have a son and daughter and their spouses and one each of their children now help me for a number of years and they do an excellent job of getting everybody to where they're supposed to go and hopefully as long as it's not a rainy day where well, this all works out very well. Uh, the pro of performing a marriage this also takes a reasonable amount of my time. When I first started with here as mayor, there wasn't too many requests or anything for the marriages at that time. But with the buildup of the areas and, and people coming in from other areas, I, there's much more demand than I can possibly take care of anymore. I try to do as many as I can because I think it's a, a good thing. I uh, get an opportunity to meet with many people that I would not ordinarily talk to in the past. 
they come here to Doylestown, many I'm meeting in the restaurants here, and sometimes I have to meet them for rehearsals and things. Uh, but the, generally the thing that takes a little bit of time, and I have an opportunity to then uh, to give them a brochure on the town so that they know where the various businesses and things are established here, so that when they came back here they have a place to go. And I think from a public relations standpoint, this has all worked out very well. I know you represent uh, the borough at various uh, functions, uh, for example, the uh, dedication of the historical markers sponsored by uh, our society, and uh, you lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, you've been to every one of those, and I'm sure there are many, many other events uh, where you appear on behalf of the borough. and. Uh, you don't receive any uh, additional compensation for uh, any No, of I this feel day. I've been very fortunate uh, living and working here in Doylestown. And once I was in a position where I could give some of my time, I felt that this uh, was something I both enjoyed doing and should be doing in return. Well, that's very good. And uh, I certainly want to uh, thank and commend you uh, for that. You were in the uh, military during the war, weren't you? Uh, Yes, uh, it was uh, a little bit by accident. When I graduated in high school in 1938, I expected to go with the Crown Cork and Seal Company, the office of in Philadelphia at that time, to work over in Portugal in their cork industry over there in the cork trees. And what they usually did was to send uh, maybe five or six people over there on a yearly basis, and they furnished the quarters and uh, food and a little bit of spending money. At the end of that period, about half of them then would be hired with the company, and I thought that. Uh, knowing about the crown and the clown closure business that uh, maybe this is something that I would like to get into. Uh, things were on a temporary hold at that time. There were war clouds in Europe and uh, there was civil unrest in Portugal at the time. So uh, they kept putting it off and putting it off. So one day I told my father that uh, I thought that I would then join the military for 36 months at the end of that time. If nothing developed, then I would come and work with him and he thought this was fine. So I then went to uh, Philadelphia to one of the recruiters down there and I told him I was interested in going into the service at that time and I had a bunch of papers to fill out and stuff and he said, that, well, we'll call you in a couple days. And he surely did. After about three days I received a phone call and he said that we have an opening in Edgewood Arsenal in the Chemical Warfare Service that you might be interested in. He said it's a very small unit, it's the only one in the country at that time. Uh, there are two other facilities, one in the Panama Canal and one in Hawaii. But he says, he, uh, you're within about 100 miles from home, there'll be a lot of weekends off and things, and this should work out real well for you. So I says, fine. So then I went down to Edgewood Arsenal. Uh, I stayed there for uh, about two and a half year period, and then I got sent up to the uh, Boston Port of Embarkation in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And this again was a very uh, small operation, so to speak, from a military standpoint. Uh, we had five, five or six uh, military people there and about 25 or 30 civilians. And we stored the chemical clothing that the troops that were going to Newfoundland, Greenland, and Iceland. In the building, it was a five-story warehouse, a fairly modern building. They had quarters on the top floor and a cafeteria in the basement level where you could come and go at any time. And the days of the troop movement, then the troops would come in from the staging area and there would be lectures and things. They'd be furnished their gas masks and then we had a gas chamber on the roof of the building that they would have to go through that and then they'd go back to their ships and then the things would be loaded and then they would be off their destination. After about two years there, then I was sent up to the Northwest Service Command in an Alberta province in Canada. Uh, to close down a facility, the chemical facility there that was no longer needed. Uh, there was no more threat from the Japanese from the West Coast at that time, and everything was supposed to be closed out. So when I got there, uh, there was only two other people there at the time. They didn't know what they were supposed to be doing or anything. But we eventually got everything together and things were shipped back to California. And uh, after about a four-month period, then I came back to Camp Upton, Long Island, and I asked if I could be assigned a unit someplace because I really hadn't been with anybody for all this period of time. And they said, well, there was one unit going to be formed. Uh, some of the principals were going to be in Alabama, and then they'd be sent to Texas, and they were to get the rest of the people, and then he wasn't sure where they would go. So I said, this was fine.
saying, oh, I was willing to do that. So I went to Alabama for a few months and into Texas. And there, when we, after we had the rest of the people and did the training was finished, uh, we went then to California and then went to the Philippine Islands. I went to uh, Lady first and down to Mindanao and then back up to Luzon near Manila. Uh, at that point in time, we called in the rest of the troops who were in the other outlying areas and we're going to be issued winter clothing because we we're going to the island of Honshu in northern Japan. Excuse and, me, uh, what year was this? This was in 1945. Oh, okay. So you were in the Philippines... Uh, From January 1945 to, I see. to December. Okay, thanks. At that point in time, then the, uh, shortly thereafter, the two bombs were dropped and uh, the war was over. I had sufficient points to come home at that time, so I was able to get a boat from uh, Manila back to California. And I got a plane ride to McGuire in New Jersey and got discharged in Camp Dix. Uh, my father picked me up and I thought, well, the next day this is going to be uh, a big homecoming day after being away for, for a year. And it didn't turn out to be quite that way because I found out the next morning that uh, five of the boys that uh, lived within a block of my house mm -hmm. had been killed in the service. So I spent the whole day going around talking to their mothers and things. And it wasn't an easy thing, but it was mm -hmm. something I felt that I had to do. Now, that evening, my father told me that he had received a letter from the National Ballast at Carbonated Beverages a week or so before that there were going to be different courses offered at a few of the different uh, schools around the country for some of their members. And uh, I inquired about this. The closest one that was going to be to us was at Drexel University in Philadelphia. So I was able to go there under the GI Bill to Drexel. I commuted back and forth daily by uh, train. And if you completed that course, and then you would do an on-the-job training program, and that would last six months, which the government would pay you for, and then you would be on your own. And uh, that worked out very well. And I was able to do the on-job training in our own plant, and so nothing was changed. So uh, you, all in all, you spent, uh, what was it, five years uh, in the uh, service? Six. Six years in the six service. Six years, a couple I months. Yeah. And uh, now, uh, looking back uh, on Doylestown, uh, all these years, uh, would you like to see Doylestown change or remain the same? Or, uh, what are your observations well, about Doylestown? Doylestown has changed uh, over a period of years. At the end of the Second World War, there were three big annexations to the town. The first one was in the Maplewood section of town. Uh, this was uh, primarily for veterans at that time. It was a large plot of ground owned by the Radcliffe Farm. There were going to be 13 acres of parkland. And the three first homes, Brooks homes, that were built there were sold for just a little under $10,000 at that time. Of course, since then, there the park uh, has been opened up to uh, everyone, and there are much more larger and more substantial homes there, and all very nice. Uh, this was followed by an annexation of the old orchard farm off of 202 in Doylestown with some lovely homes there. And then there was a follow-up with a Clements track, uh, when that was annexed into the town with some equally loved homes built there at that time. Uh, the township has grown considerably at that time, and uh, we have a lot more people around, so things uh, just by numbers have uh, sort of changed. But I think in the last few years when the revitalization board here in the borough was formed, uh, there were also some drastic changes here in the town. The first thing that happened was a number of the historic streetlights started to be installed. There were brick pavers installed in the sidewalks and things. And uh, there were safety measures on the streets because of the numerous people and cars that were the Again, to be coming involved in our town here. And th these were all done in the entrance of safety. Uh, the people are going to be here and the cars are going to be here and we just have to continue to work to see that we reach a happy reunion between both parties. And I think that that part should continue. Uh, there was also in recent years with the change in the liquor laws, several upstale uh, restaurants uh, from the, the liquor changes that took place and it's an area in town here. We have many of the people in town that patronize these places and we also have many people come in the outside to come to these restaurants and I'm sorry to say my favorite restaurant is no longer here in town and that was called the uh, Texas Hot Wiener. It was located on South Main Street right, right. below the paper Unicorn and when I went to high school my mother was away for the day. My sisters usually ate at the school cafeteria but I was given a quarter for lunch and I'd always had the same thing. 
and I'd go to the Texas hot winter and I'd have two <laughs> hot dogs piled high with a relish and a soda for 25 cents with no tax or tip. I'm sorry to say that no longer exists. Well, you've spent a, a long lifetime uh, here, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and you've had a great uh, beneficial effect on uh, Doylestown. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say in conclusion? Uh, well, I think Doylestown has always been a pretty much of a model town for many of the communities our size. And two years ago, when the National Historic Trust Preservation uh, chose Doylestown as one of the 12 most distinctive destinations in the country, I think that this proved to us that we were, have been doing the right thing, and I think this is the policy that we should continue to do. Well, many, many thanks for a very, very informative uh, interview. Very well done. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye.